and welcome to Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Another beautiful Friday afternoon here in Hawaii. And we're doing some particularly likable science today. We have w with us uh, Michelle uh, Berbari, if I got that right, and Stacy Robinson, from, from, both from NOAA. And we're going to be talking about monk seals and monk seal vaccination, particularly. So um, it seems like an odd thing. I ran into an article, actually, in Science Magazine. They had a, a one-page spread on, on Michelle's work and had a, a picture of her jabbing, jabbing a monk seal. And it just immediately intrigued me. I said, this is good local science people here in Hawaii should know about and should care about. So uh, here, here they are. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into this. It seems like an odd, an odd career choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, my, my job is actually as a veterinarian for NOAA. I, I'm charged with overseeing the health of the population. And because okay. Hawaiian monk seals are endangered, uh, it means that we're looking after their health in a lot of different ways. It means that we're monitoring their health for exposure to different diseases. We look at why animals die. We look at ways to also protect their health. Mm -hmm. And so vaccinating seals is one of the ways that we think we can best help the population um, fend itself off against something catastrophic, such as a disease outbreak. Okay, good. Stacy. Yeah, and so I'm a research ecologist with the Monk Seal Research Program at NOAA, and so I guess I, I sort of fall into analyzing a lot of the data that we collect and helping look at efficient ways that we're going to go about something like a vaccination program and evaluating that when we do it. Excellent. And we've got a little video to, that shows sort of what, what this vaccinating seal is all about. It's a little different from your standard visit to a doctor's office mm -hmm. and getting a human vaccination. <laughs> And uh, here, you, here you are. Yeah, so this is one of our coworkers. This is Tracy um, out on Rabbit Island. So those of you on Oahu are probably quite familiar where Rabbit Island is. And Tracy just gave the signal, which is our silly little signal to remind ourselves that we took the safety off of the pole syringe. And Tracy's holding the pole syringe, which is loaded with one milliliter of vaccine. And she's gonna go poke the seal. Well, obviously doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they really don't, t they, they, they do react, but then they kind of tend to hang out on the beach, which was something that we didn't necessarily know what to expect, yeah. but we were pleasantly surprised that a lot of seals turned around, vocalized, but um, often just went right back to sleep. Right, right. <laughs> they get over it surprisingly quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Like a, a big horse fly bit them, you know. Exactly, <laughs> right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, well, that's, you know, it's valuable. They, they want to be out on the beach, right? They're d doing that for reasons of their own health and well-being, presumably, and, yep. and basking to warm up or whatever, so it mm -hmm. means a lot to them. They don't want to break the thing, go back in, cool off in the water, and, yeah. So that, that's great. That's great. That the, while it looks a little intrusive, it, it's not apparently deeply disturbing to the animals. Yeah. Excellent. And that's an important part of everything right. that we do. We're always trying right. to, to make sure that we're having as little impact on the animals as possible. Right. So. And so this uh, implement in front of us here mm -hmm. is the, uh, is the uh, what, what do you this call is, this? Yeah, so, so <laughs> this is a pole syringe, and it's not completely put together. And obviously, we left the needle out right. just so that everything would be safe okay. today. Right. Um, so but it is, it is a spring-loaded device. And so this is, um, this is how you load the spring. Uh -huh. And after you do that, you always make sure that the safety is on. And then inside is a syringe, which we would put vaccine in. Mm -hmm. And it fits. It's a syringe specifically made for this. Mm -hmm. And then everything just attaches. On to the end, just like that, and then you charge it, and it's ready to go. Uh -huh. And um, we would have a needle on the end right. of this, and then as soon as you turn this into the safety off position, it's essentially um, as soon as it comes in contact with the seal, it's going to discharge, uh -huh. and it happens really fast. <laughs> so, um, so it's great, and it's a small volume. This uh -huh. syringe can hold. This is a big syringe. We obviously don't fill this whole thing with vaccine. So, um, the syringe holds about 10 milliliters. Uh -huh. This um, vaccine is only a little tiny bit of that syringe. Uh -huh. So, it pops in really quickly, uh -huh. um, and uh, and yeah, that's. That's how it works. And it's a pretty common tool used in um, working with, with wildlife that you don't necessarily um, have the ability to bring them into a vet hospital, put them on an exam <laughs> table, have a technician come in and hold them, and the veterinarian gives their little vaccine. Um, this is a much less intrusive way of going about it. So. Excellent, excellent, yeah. Um, very, very, very different 
uh, than par probably what you envisioned yourself when you were going to vet school, doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you're going to get into with marine mammals, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it's, it, it is intriguing how our lives take those turns. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, about this, this, what you're, you're vaccinating against this distemper virus, right? Now, is this a, a naturally occurring virus, or was it sort of introduced into the, the populations, or...? Yeah, it's a, it's a virus that actually is not, that we know of, at all circulating in monk seals. And the reason that we know that is because anytime we do handle a monk seal, whether it's to um, attach a tag to them or um, do any sort of health assessment, we're collecting blood samples, and that's been going on for, for decades, mm -hmm. um, far before my involvement with the program. So we're really fortunate to be able to lean on an extensive um, base of information. Mm -hmm. and. In looking at those samples that have been collected over time, no antibodies in the blood of monk seals have ever been detected to a distemper virus or a morbili virus. Um, so we do not think that the virus is here or that monk seals are typically exposed to it. And that's actually the reason that it's a threat. So right. when you have viruses that are routinely circulating around in a population, whether it be humans and the seasonal flu right. or something like that, then there is some level of pre-existing immunity right. that is existing in the population. For monk seals, we don't actually think they have that, but what we do know is that this virus has caused die-offs of tens of thousands of seals in other parts of the world. Right. And it's also killed large numbers of cetaceans or dolphins mm -hmm. as well. So the worry is that should it end up here in Hawaii, we could actually lose a substantial part of the population because right. if you lost tens of thousands of seals in other parts of the world, say in Europe, mm -hmm. then for the 1,300 monk seals that we actually have left, they'd be at, at great risk. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Even. So I see. So you're, you're doing this as a preemptive, preventative, pre preventative health care, as yeah, it were. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, that's remarkable uh, foresight on Noah's part then, because, yeah, mm -hmm. if this, how does this virus get introduced to these other populations, or is that, is that not clear? Well, it can, it can happen from um, different ways. So sometimes we, we don't always know how mm -hmm. that happens. Um, canine distemper, so mm -hmm. that's one of the viruses that you actually vaccinate your pet dogs at home against. Right. And there have been introductions of canine distemper that are thought to have affected marine mammal populations okay. as well. So that's one way. Right. Um, it is sometimes circulating in other populations and how exactly it got there in the first place is not completely known. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that we have that we're not sure of either is whether or not a cetacean or a dolphin that may have it could actually transfer that. So it's thought that that could go between different types of cetaceans. Uh. Whether or not it could actually go from a cetacean to a pinniped, we're not entirely sure. Oh, okay, okay, interesting. So, um, and then you, you get into the whole sort of population dynamics business you have to be thinking yeah. about, right? This is where some data analysis mm -hmm. comes in, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so thinking about the, you know, the pre-planning that NOAA is doing with such a proactive vaccination program before we've even seen the disease, this was based on a lot of analysis that came be long before the action. Mm -hmm. um, so we went through a lot of, so we've got population dynamics data on the seals, how their populations grow and move over time and move from place to place. And then also sort of if you think of the virus population, we've got population dynamics data on these morbili viruses from other situations where, where they have outbroken. And so some of our colleagues put together some pretty substantial like computer simulation models. And so even though we haven't seen the virus here yet, we could say we have ideas about how rapidly it can spread. We have ideas about how long it takes to make an animal sick, how long they can spread it to other animals. We know about seals and how much they contact other seals and how much they could spread it. So we're able to use those computer simulations to sort of play out these different scenarios. And mm -hmm. we can say, this is what a disease might do in the population. And we saw those results. We're like, wow, that's really frightening. We really should do something about this. Mm -hmm. And so then we can use those same simulations to say, OK, well, so once we see disease, then we'll go out and start vaccinating the rest of them, and we'll be fine, right? And the simulation said, no. <laughs> and <laughs> partly, said that would be too late, basically. Basically, yes, yeah. it would be too late. And part of that is, you know, much like you have to get your kids boosters for some of their early childhood vaccinations, we've got to give the SEALs one dose of vaccine and then give them a booster you know, three to four weeks later. So that lag time uh -huh. is just a virus can spread too far sure. that, you know, within that period of time. So our, our sort of simulation models were able to tell us that if we're going to have, you know, if we're going to have the ability to vaccinate and really keep the population protected from a disease outbreak like this, we've got to do it before the disease ever gets here. And so that's where we came up with then this 
this plan for sort of the prophylactic vaccination use. And you have to obviously cover a certain percentage of the seals. You have to get a certain percentage vaccinated and keep that some X percentage. And, and roughly, yeah. what is that? Um, well, it depends on how many seals and how much contact they're in. Um, in Oahu and Kauai, we have, you know, it's sometimes it's nice to live on a small island. <laughs> and while we would love to see more monk seals, it's nice to deal with a small population because the numbers are really manageable. Mm -hmm. And so based on a population of about 40, 45 animals on Oahu, we figured to be almost certain we were going to have what we call herd immunity. So mm -hmm. that's the number of animals that if you vaccinate this many, most others will be protected because there just aren't enough susceptible animals in the population mm -hmm. to really spread disease very far. And that number is only about 20 to be pretty, pretty much certain that we're going to get that herd immunity number. And again, we used these simulations and we say, well, we haven't had this disease yet, so there's uncertainty, right? What sure. if it's more transmissible than we thought? What if it's more deadly than we thought? Right. What if they're in contact more than we thought? And so we can look at those those ranges. Um, and so we see like with eight animals even, it's like, oh, quite a few scenarios, you'd be okay. Right. And 15 animals, even more scenarios. And by 20 animals, it's like, yeah, we're gonna be okay in most scenarios that get thrown Excellent. at us. Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great example of the, the whole uncertainty in science. And one of the things that makes science science, right? Is if, you, if you knew all these answers in advance, you know. Then we would be, just fix the problem. Right, right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you've essentially then identified roughly 20 seals all around Oahu. And yeah. you know that these seals, they are, they are have, they're tagged, basically? A lot of them are tagged. Some come, of them have a scar that's okay. distinctive. Um, we've got an amazing network of volunteers that are out combing beaches on an almost daily basis. And boy, they are so good at identifying the seals mm -hmm. in their neighborhoods. And it's often the same seal comes back to the same place at the same time for weeks at a time. It'd be nice if they were that reliable. Right. <laughs> they're pretty reliable. But, but, but they're not on a schedule, Maybe right? not quite that schedule. <laughs> No, no one's given them a paycheck to show up, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, and then, so, you, but, but you've tried to hit basically 20 seals, and you go back and have to hit this same group of yep. 20 again within some window of time. Yeah, exactly. And that, that must be even a little trickier because getting the first time, you have no particular time frame right. to it. But once you, you start at a clock ticking, then, as it were. Yeah, exactly. And I think when we when we first started and getting the, you know, the first round of animals, you know, we would do things like say, oh, what's a good day that works for everyone? Well, Tuesday's good. OK, we're going to go out Tuesday, and we're going to find the seals that are around, and we're going to vaccinate those seals. Great, Tuesday it is. And you know, you have a plan, you right. go out, you do your thing, then you go back, you do work in your office the rest of the week. And then when it's time for boosters, you just get a call. Right. Like, oh, Barbara called and she saw this seal at this place. Drop everything, go get it. Right. <laughs> it's now in that window, yep. and, and so exactly. we better better jump on it right away. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I'll tell you what I was going to say. I'm sure you guys both have good stories about <laughs> encounters with seals. But before we get to those, uh, we're going to have to take a short break. So uh, Michelle and Stacy here from NOAA talking about vaccinating monk seals. And I'm your host, Ethan Allen on Likeable Science. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha. How you doing? Welcome to Ibachi Talk. Gordo de Texar here. We're here every Friday from 1 o'clock till about 1.45 and we talk tech with many, many great guests. I got uh, Andrew, the security guy who helps me co-host, and I got Poppy Chulo who comes in once in a while to, to help us through the show. So please come join Hibachi Talk every Friday. Angus will be here too. So remember, like we say at the end of every show, how you doing? Yeah, 
Dan, you're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today in Think Tech Studios are Michelle and Stacy from NOAA, veterinarian and data analyst, uh, <laughs> talking about monk seal vaccination, all, all the, the great uh, reasons to do it, and, and uh, the, the whys and wherefores. And it's a pretty, uh, sounds like a pretty interesting job on uh, all sorts of levels, finding out how, how many monk seals to vaccinate, when to, when to do it, how to do it. And uh, as we saw in the video clip earlier, it's, it looks like a, an interesting part of your days when you actually have to go out there and poke them. Yeah. <laughs> a little, little different from the standard doctor's office visit. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I know we had, uh, you, you had sent some other figures to me about that were showing something, I think, about the population dynamics mm -hmm. going on. The network? Yes, exactly. Sure. And. Yeah, so this is kind of just what we were just talking about, about deciding um, how many and which seals to vaccinate. So on the, gosh, I think it's on my left, on the screen, the really connected jumble of points there. So that's an actual social network diagram of the monk seals on Oahu. So okay. this is based on the actual sightings that we get um, when people call in and say, I saw this seal at this beach or when our volunteer network fills out you know, their data of what seals they're seeing and what places, we're able to figure out which seals are in contact with each other. Sure. And it turns out over time, most seals on Oahu sort of, there are some sort of hot spots, but seals get around or one seal, you know, meets mm -hmm. this seal and gets around to another one. So they're really, really connected. Mm -hmm. So from a social behavior standpoint, we're like, wow, that's cool. The seals mm -hmm. kind of hang out, they right. get around. From a disease standpoint, we look at that and we're like, oh my gosh, every one of those lines is a way that a disease right. could spread from one seal to another seal. So right. in that graph, the points are seals and the lines are connections between them where disease could spread. Right. And so basically what we're doing with vaccinations is we're trying to break up some of the lines in right. that diagram because if a seal is vaccinated, it can't spread right. disease from one to the other. And so what we have on the other side, at least on my right side, is that's sort of the after diagram. So mm -hmm. those gray dots out to the side, those are all the seals that we vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And so the little connected bit in the middle are the seals that still are susceptible and the level of contacts that remain. And so you can see just looking at, you know, from the before to the after graphic, you can see how much we really took apart Mm -hmm. that contact network and took apart so many of those pathways where right. disease could spread through these vaccinations. And so now, but those gray spots, the gray dots there are still seals that are in the population, they're still in contact, so if they're the seal that gets contacted, the chain of potential disease right. spread just stops. Right. And so so that's, that's kind of how herd immunity works yeah. and how vaccinating some yeah. ends up protecting the whole. Yeah. And so we were really happy with the outcomes of our vaccination program because we were able to get enough seals that we think we're in a really good position in terms of protecting the whole population mm -hmm. with the number we vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So this looks like a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, undertaking because there's lots of people who have to be doing lots of different kinds of things. You've got this, what sounds like an extensive network of volunteers, you guys with your uh, considerable expertise and mul multiple skills, obviously. Um, but the, the, the program is really, I mean, what you're doing is really part of just a bigger program to protect the monk seal population. And that involves other work. You have researchers who are out in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands where more monk seals live. Um, actually, the main bulk of the population mm -hmm. is out there. Although, as we were talking about a little bit before the show, at, at times you're actually moving seals back and forth. Um, and perhaps you should uh, go, in, go into the, a little bit of the reasoning on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, one of the reasons that we move seals around is when they need help. Mm -hmm. So we're fortunate that um, seals that in the northwestern wine islands where we may only be there for certain months out of the year and be there on board a ship, um, now we can bring them to a facility on the big island that's run by a partner institution, the Marine Mammal Center. It's called Cape Kaiola, and it's a facility where they can actually care for these wild seals until we have the ability to return them to the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Uh -huh. So any seals that come down from the northwestern Hawaiian Islands are always returned back to um, that region of the archipelago. And, um, and it really has enhanced our ability to, to target one of the other threats to the population, which is malnutrition. Right. And that would be particularly in the younger seals, right, when they're just they finished nursing, but they're not really adults yet. They're probably exactly. not as good at getting food. They may, may be a little more vulnerable, vulnerable to predation. Mm -hmm. um, 
and some of them just aren't quite up for it, right? Well, and they also just get outcompeted when they're right. smaller. They're getting outcompeted by um, in the in the archipelago out there. There's a lot of large jacks and sharks, so big fish that are competing with monk seals for food. Uh -huh. So the monk seals put the work in to, you know, turning over a piece of coral and getting out an octopus and a shark or a jack will come by and, and scoop that up instead. Uh -huh. So unfortunately the little juvenile seals can, can tend to mm. um, lose energy struggling to get their food and not end up with that caloric benefit going back in. Uh -huh. So then if you find such a seal, you just, of course, walk up to him quietly and pick him up calmly. And <laughs> <laughs> dump him oh, in the sack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of what we go for. <laughs> <laughs> well, generally, if they're, right. if they're in bad enough shape to, to need to come in for right. assistance, then they actually are not, um, they're not so feisty that right. they're um, difficult to pick up and, right. and bring back down. But, um, you know, they, they do still present some challenges. Mm what we start to do with them once we get them aboard the ship and a triage sort of thing is to provide them nutrition through mm -hmm. a tube that we put down their throat into their stomach and give them electrolytes and fish slurry, mm -hmm. basically a fish smoothie, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, just to get their GI tract restarted and right. that kind of thing. And, and a fair number of the animals that we do need to treat are actually pups that were um, not weaned at a high enough birth weight that we think they're likely to survive until right. the next year. And that's based on a lot of information that's been accrued over time. So we kind of have a good sense as to, you know, if they're if they're a little bit on the small side or really small once they've been um, at the time of weaning, then we can monitor them for the, for the period that we're out there. And, mm -hmm. and more likely than not, those are the ones that are going to come in as well. Uh-huh. Okay. Because you'll be out there for a while, so you'll have a chance to check on them sort of repeatedly. Indeed. And, and yeah. you can make a judgment then before you leave whether you should take them back. And then you say you... you hand them over to this facility, they keep them for a few months? Yeah, several months, again, because we're going to return them to the right. Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, we need a way to get them back out there. Right. And we generally are fortunate enough to have a cruise on the NOAA vessels that go out twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the, the primary ways that we're moving mm -hmm. these animals back and forth between the wild and rehabilitation. But once in a while, mm -hmm. the U.S. Coast Guard will, um, will ask them to, to help us out, and if they have a mission that they can pair transporting seals with, um, then they will also help us out. So we have done that a few times as well. Excellent. And so they get, in, they get this sort of rest and recreation period and mm -hmm. gain a lot of weight and, yep. and, and are much better able then to uh, survive. That's, that's, uh, that's great because there are only, you say, 1,300 monk seals. Right. That's, that's all there is in the world. Of these, that's of all these there is in the world and they're yeah. all in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, and no, uh, historically, uh, sort of, uh, is, is Hawaii the only place they've been known to live? Did, were there other populations of them elsewhere? Or, uh, there are related species see, of okay. other monk seals. So okay. there's a Mediterranean monk seal okay. in, in the Mediterranean. Right. Um, and the closest relative to Hawaiian monk seals were the Caribbean monk seals, but they went to extinct, I want to say in the 50s or 60s, okay. the last one was seen. Hmm. But so they probably, those sort of sister species probably diverged when, you know, when Panama closed off okay. the the link between the Pacific and the Caribbean. Huh. Okay, so they've been isolated here for a long, long time. They have. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, well, it's, it's great that, uh, that you guys are keep, keeping the populations going. Um, and, and what, I mean, there are a lot of kinds of seals, though, right? What, mm -hmm. what makes the Hawaiian monk seal special other than just being another kind of seal? You know, I think they're the only really tropical seal. Uh -huh. um, so if you think about other seals that you know of, you know, you're probably thinking about things in cold water environments that are chasing large schools of fish and mm -hmm. getting food that way. And so Hawaiian monk seals have a really different existence. Um, and that's one of the reasons we see, you know, they can be sort of living on this edge and we'll see things like nutritional limitation because it's, as it turns out, it's kind of a rough life making it as a tropical seal. Mm -hmm. um, and so instead of chasing down, you know, big bait balls of small fish or something like that, uh, monk seals are very specialized on foraging on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a different thing. And it's just their, their habits in warm water versus a cold water seal are pretty, pretty special. For the yeah, monk seals. I hadn't thought about that, but it's true. You generally think of seals as floating on ice flows and, right. mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you see them in association with icebergs and, right. Right, and indeed the Famous, uh, the, the bigger members, uh, or the walruses and all, are, are very strict. Uh, almost an Arctic animal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that. That's great. Um, so, when you're 
uh, I'll make my question I asked earlier. How did, how did you sort of get into this end of things? What, 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 what brought you into this work? I think our stories are probably pretty different. Pretty different. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very interested in uh, marine mammals for as long as I can remember, and that's uh -huh. probably not news to a lot of viewers uh -huh. out there. I think there are lots of people that at some point or another consider growing up to be a marine biologist. Uh -huh. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I, I actually was fortunate enough to be involved in a lab in North Carolina in college where I was um, helping with response to stranded marine mammals along the, the coastline. And um, many of those were dead animals and it really taught me that there's a lot to learn from looking at an animal and trying to understand why it died. Um, it can help you understand the health of the population overall that you're trying to understand. I mean, marine mammals are so cryptic compared mm -hmm. to a lot of their terrestrial counterparts. They're sure. very difficult to study because right. they're in the great big blue. Right. And so, um, so that was something that I found really compelling. And it was also something that got me interested in anatomy and physiology and just understanding how animals worked. So those things combined, um, ultimately I decided that the way I wanted to go about that was to be a veterinarian, so. Cool, uh, excellent. Yeah. And yeah, I think my, my path to Hawaiian monk seals was maybe a little more circuitous. Um, I think growing up and all through school, I always really wanted to do things with wildlife conservation mm -hmm. and, and ended up getting into sort of the research side of it because there were just too many fascinating things to learn. And so I ended up jumping around quite a bit. In undergrad, I was studying alligators in Louisiana. For my master's, I was studying bears and genetics in Alaska. In my PhD, I ended up studying wildlife diseases in deer in the Midwest. And so it just kind of ended up that once I got over right here, on. there was kind of this, here's this species and we cool. need to know things about their genetics. We need to Excellent. know things about diseases and things that affect Super. conservation. So all the puzzle pieces just kind of fit. Hey, well, excellent. I want to thank you both for being here. This has been just fascinating to, to learn about what you do, how you do it, and answered a lot of questions that were running around in my head. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the chance to, to share some of your learning. I'm sure our uh, audience uh, is, is the better for it. So thank you both, and aloha. Thanks, thanks, we'll hope to see you next week on another uh, episode of Likeable Science.